Welcome to part two of Rat I Wasn't Built in a Day. In part one, we explored the evolution and expansion of the Roman town of Ratai Corialtivorum. In this next part, we'll explore luxury living both inside and outside the town, find love and then lose it again, and explore life through death. We'll also look at the impacts of threats to the Roman Empire both near and far. I'm Jim Butler and this is Hidden Histories of Leicester. In 1830, the owner of a small house in the town uncovered an amazing Roman mosaic beneath the floor of his cellar, which he then permitted people to visit. When the house was demolished in the 1890s to make way for the great central railway station behind me, such was the regard for the beauty and importance of this mosaic that, rather than dig through the site as planned, the builders preserved it by constructing walls around it, creating a room beneath the new train station. Soon, members of the public were once again coming to view the mosaic that was now referred to as the Blackfriars Pavement. Here the mosaic remained for, the, for over 70 years until 1969 when it was carefully lifted and transported the short distance to be displayed in the newly opened Jewelry War Museum. But this extraordinary discovery wasn't the only evidence indicating the wealth and opulence of Roman life, especially around the northwest quarter of the town. As early as 1675, the Cyparissus mosaic was discovered on High Cross Street, approximately where High Cross Street and Vaughan Way now meet. The mosaic is thought to show the legend of Cyparissus, who loved his stag so much that when it was killed, he wept and wept until he himself became a cypress tree. In 1898, the Peacock pavement was discovered in nearby St Nicholas Street, where it too would remain until its successful removal to the Jewelry Wall Museum. All of these mosaics date from the mid to late second century and demonstrate how wealthy some people in the town were becoming by this point. This view has only been reinforced in recent years as further excavations have revealed greater and greater finds. In 2017, beneath the former Stibby factory site on the corner of Vaughan Way and High Cross Street, where the Novotel now stands, a mosaic was uncovered that would originally have measured a massive 10 metres by 6 metres. This impressive mosaic would have been the floor to a single room in what was clearly a very high status house. But perhaps the clearest indication of high status town living comes from the site I mentioned earlier, the Vine Street Villa. The elaborate courtyard house contained over 26 rooms, including formal reception rooms, a dining room, bedrooms, offices, a kitchen and slave quarters, all housed under a roof covered with diamond-shaped slates. It even looks like at one point the owners started to build their own private bathhouse on the site, but the work was never completed due to subsidence issues. Oh well, there's always the public baths. It's worth remembering that for the first hundred years or so, Ratai had no discernible defences, certainly no major defensive walls. So other than being close to amenities, the advantages of town living were not huge. However, in the late second or early third century, defences began to be erected. Initially, these were simple ditches and earth ramparts with timber palisades, but by the end of the third century, huge stone walls had been added to the ramparts, probably about four metres in height. Whether these defences were built to deter would-be invaders or were simply a statement of civic pride is unclear. However, by the middle of the third century, the Roman Empire was already in crisis, trying to deal with civil war, plague, economic depression and barbarian incursions. More closely to home, threats to Roman Britannia included the Picts from Scotland, as well as the Angles, Saxons and Jutes from Germany and Scandinavia. In fact, in AD 255, London's city wall along the north bank of the Thames was completed, following increasing threats from seaborne Germanic tribes. With the building of Ratai's walls, areas of the townscape were effectively redrawn. We know from the recent waterside excavations behind me that one property boundary wall was pushed over in its entirety to make way for the new defences. Furthermore, once the new town wall was in place, the buildings to the north of the town, that now found themselves outside of the defences, were simply abandoned. So perhaps this does suggest that there was at least a perceived external threat to the town, 
or maybe other economic factors like taxes made it cheaper to live within the walls. There were some people though who chose to live outside of Ratai, perhaps preferring the relative peace and quiet it brought. One such site was discovered about a quarter of a mile away, just across the river. So let's take a look. In ancient Rome, the area inside a walled town was referred to as an herb, spelled U-R-B. Those precincts that were under, below or beyond the herbs were classed as sub-herbs, hence the term suburb. Although Ratai never had any areas that we could easily define as suburbs, especially once the town walls were built, there were people who resided not far from the town. One such rural estate was here on an incline just a quarter of a mile west of the River Saw, beside the Roman road to Mansetta. In 1851, under the site of a cherry orchard in Norfolk Street, a Roman villa was uncovered, with large rooms complete with elaborate and colourful mosaics. In 1979, when the area was redeveloped and the King Richard's Road extended, archaeologists discovered the north wing of the cherry orchard villa, now commonly known as the Norfolk Street Villa. In this wing, archaeologists excavated a private bathhouse, which again had its own mosaics, but even more impressively, they uncovered the remains of some beautiful frescoes. Frescoes were amazing wall decorations, painted directly onto the plaster whilst it was still wet. Due to the fragile nature of the plaster, it is extremely rare for frescoes to survive, but due to a twist of fate, this wall that contained the fresco fell face down into the cellar beneath the room it once adorned, which luckily for us preserved the plaster, paint and all. The Norfolk Street Villa covered a huge area with commanding views of the town below and the hilly countryside around it. The estate may even have been the rural retreat of a leading member of the town's elite, who would also have had a townhouse within the walls. Due to the similarities in design and date, the owner may even have been the same person that had the Vine Street Villa built. Although the estate is thought to date from the latter half of the third century, again it demonstrates the immense wealth and lavish lifestyles of some of Ratai's more fortunate Romano-British citizens. The third century brought further enhancements to those living in the town. The first stood just behind me under the travel lodge and was a huge covered market hall called a McKellum. Standing at a height of a three or four storey modern building today, the McKellum had a central aisle that was flanked on either side by arched colonnades and further smaller aisles. Between each of these would have been dozens of stalls and small shops selling all sorts of goods and wares, very much like Leicester Market still does today. The second addition to the town was likely to be a theatre which, thanks to the recent excavations on the Stibby site behind me, is thought to have stood beneath Vaughan Way. The theatre is not to be confused with an amphitheatre where public games were held, like the Colosseum in Rome. No, this is a traditional theatre with a stage and actors where plays were performed before a live audience. It was probably similar in size and scale to the theatre uncovered in St Albans, with audiences gathering on terrace seating to watch the shows. Having said that, an amazing bronze key handle discovered on this site gives us a glimpse of a more gruesome form of Roman entertainment. The handle depicts a barbarian grappling with a lion whilst four boys cower in terror. This is thought to be a reference to the practice in Roman law where criminals and prisoners of war were executed by effectively being thrown to the lions. So perhaps Ratai's theatre did occasionally stage more than dramatic productions, who knows? there may even have been lions kept in the town. Other clues to the existence of the theatre include the discovery of a large curved wall that stretches out beneath Vaughan Way and could have formed the outer wall of the building and acted as a support for the terrace seating. Portions of a large ceramic mask have also been discovered, perhaps as an early incarnation of the comedy and tragedy masks that we have come to associate with the theatre. And finally, over 1,000 years before Shakespeare put quill to parchment, there is a tantalising glimpse into the romance of two star-crossed local lovers. 
In Fair Ratai is where we lay our scene, where once lived Lucius the Gladiator and his paramour, the actress Veracunda. Was it here in the theatre that they met and fell in love? That we will never know. But it appears that love did indeed blossom between the two. And as it did, one gifted to the other a small piece of broken Samianware pottery with the inscription Veracunda Ludia Lucius Gladiator, meaning Veracunda the actress and Lucius the gladiator. A hole was then bored into the shirt so that the recipient could wear it as a love token wherever they went. Of course, the true tragedy of this story is not knowing how the love token came to be separated from their owner. Did the love between Veracunda and Lucius wither and die? Was the love token ripped off and thrown in a fit of rage and hurt during a bitter argument? Or was Lucius clutching the token during his final fatal gladiatorial fight, the shirt slipping from his grasp as he fell bleeding to the floor? Sadly, we will never know the fate of Veracunda and Lucius. But thanks to this find, we do know that, like us today, they both lived and that they both loved here in this town we call home. Well, who else did live and die here all those centuries ago? Let's find out. As we have discovered in other episodes, it is through the mortal remains of the town's dead that we get the best sense of the people who actually lived in Ratai. Roman law demanded that all dead people must be buried beyond the town's walls, and over the course of the occupation in Ratai, large cemeteries developed along the roads leaving the town. The first and oldest of them was here to the southwest of the town, running for about 200 metres between the river and the Foss Way, which ran close to the modern day Narba Road. The cemetery was first discovered in the Victorian era by builders constructing these rows of terraced houses. Upon discovering the skeletons, they knew they had unearthed ancient burials from the Roman and Saxon eras. So, to respectfully commemorate the burials, they named the streets where they were discovered, Roman Street and Saxon Street. And then named the surrounding streets after other ancient peoples to maintain the theme. Hence Celt Street, Britain Street, Gaul Street and Norman Street. Unfortunately, there was no systematic recording of the burials discovered in the Victorian period, but recent developments on the former Equity Shoes site enabled archaeologists to properly excavate a large area of the former cemetery, and what they discovered gives us an incredible insight into Leicester's former residence. The cemetery was in use from the late 1st century up until the early 5th century, but was predominantly used during the 3rd and 4th centuries, well, in the excavated area at least. The 83 burials uncovered had no common alignment, making them look very haphazard. However, the fact that none overlapped suggests that there were at least some sort of marker over each grave so that bodies would not be buried on top of each other, and in some cases, adults could be buried next to their children who had died young. A quarter of burials were of children, mostly aged between 1 and 12 years of age, which is not surprising given infant mortality rates at the time. There were signs of poor health and nutrition during childhood. Four were small for their age, while two may have suffered from rickets. Potentially healed rickets with presence in some adults and one adolescent may have had scurvy. One poor child, who appears to have been born and raised in the Mediterranean, showed signs of rickets, and you can't help but wonder whether it was the move to the colder, darker Britain that contributed to their tragic end. Only a fifth of the population had survived to older age, which at this time is anything over about the age of 46 years. One older woman had degenerative disc disease and osteoarthritis in her spine, shoulders, right wrist and hand. One man had multiple healed fractures to his shoulders and torso, coupled with ruptured tricep muscles. He also had unusually flattened ribs, which might suggest his torso had been heavily and frequently bound, possibly to aid healing. All of these incidents could indicate that the man suffered from seizures. Interestingly, up to five people in the cemetery had African or mixed ancestry. Stable isotope analysis on two of these skeletons indicates that they had grown up in Britain, one in the Pennines and the other in Leicester, and so may have been descended from migrants. But by today's standards, these people would be classed as British citizens, and their respectful burials in this cemetery suggest that they were accepted and respected in their own society too. Damage to the skeletons show that trauma was frequent part of life at the time. 
with evidence of healed fractures, soft tissue injuries, dislocations and fractured teeth. Many appear to be accidental, mostly likely caused by slips, trips and falls. However, one poor individual met a bloody and violent end. When a skeleton was uncovered, with his decapitated head placed between his knees, the archaeologist started to explore a number of possible reasons, from murder and criminal execution to religious or superstitious beliefs. However, closer examination of the remains showed that the man had been the victim of a violent attack. Multiple sharp force cuts and injuries were inflicted to his face and jaw, neck and upper left arm. These attacks fractured multiple teeth while the injuries to the neck came from the front and both sides, eventually achieving full decapitation. Was this poor soul the innocent victim of a random attack or was this a brutal attack of passion or revenge, righteously and grievously enacted? We will simply never know. Ratai's other large-scale cemeteries were just outside the southern and eastern gates into the town. Although there is evidence of early pagan burials aligned in different directions with grave goods, similar to the Western Road Cemetery, in the 3rd and 4th centuries this appears to have become a Christian cemetery, with almost all burials from this period aligned loosely east to west. However, this alignment could also be due to the influence of the surrounding roads, so we cannot confirm that they are Christian burials. However, there were little or no burial goods found with the skeletons, which could support the Christian theory. Analysis of the skeletons from this southern cemetery has shown that people buried here experienced times of nutritional stress and led physically demanding lives, with high levels of muscular development showing that they engaged in strenuous physical activity that built their strength. However, there was also substantial wear to many individuals' teeth suggesting that they had eaten a relatively hard and coarse diet. The majority of the males lived longer than the females, who had a high level of mortality between the ages of 18 and 35, commonly referred to as the childbearing years. This also meant that more of the males in the cemetery had lived into a and beyond middle age and, therefore, suffered more from conditions associated with getting older, like osteoarthritis and high levels of wear and tear on one or more joints and the spine. One individual in this cemetery was discovered to have had a trepanation hole in their skull. Trepanation is a surgical procedure whereby a hole is bored or scraped into the skull and, throughout history, has been used to try to treat a variety of health-related problems from the release of pressured blood built up following an accident to the exorcism of evil spirits. The discovery of this skull does suggest that there was an element of medical care available to Ratai citizens. Sadly though, despite the intervention, it doesn't appear that the individual survived the surgery. By the end of the third century and into the fourth, Ratai entered a period of change. The boom decades of the late second and early third centuries had long gone, and it appears that some of the town's wealthier residents were no longer living in the town. At some time between 320 and 355 AD, one of the residents of the Grand Courtyard House on Vine Street hid a huge ingot of recycled lead and a hoard of coins in the fabric of the building. This suggests that people were afraid of social unrest and, for whatever reason, whoever hid the items never returned to retrieve them. This social unrest could have been due to the growing raids and incursions on Roman Britain by the so-called barbarian tribes. From the 360s until the end of the century, invaders from Scotland, Ireland and Germany begin coordinating their attacks and launch raids on Roman Britain. Many towns are plundered throughout the province and Britain falls into a state of anarchy. In the early years of the 5th century, huge numbers of troops and government officials were expelled or withdrawn from Britain as Rome came under sustained attack and then, in the year 410, with increased incursions from the Saxons, Scots, Picts and Angles, Britain turns to Roman Emperor Honorius for help. He writes back telling them to look to their own defences and refuses to send any help. This letter marks the formal end of Roman Britain. Throughout this period, Ratai's opulent villas and huge civic buildings start to fall into decline and disrepair, 
But this is not to say that life in the town grinds to a halt. On the contrary, even with many of the ruling elite gone, the people of Leicester, the people of Britain, seems to do what they would go on to do for millennia to come. They simply adapted and got on with it. At the Vine Street Villa, some enterprising people repurposed areas of the courtyard house with the deliberate demolition of its main reception rooms and the conversion of the remaining building into a row of workshops, including a smithy. In fact, despite being abandoned by some of its former residents, this area of the town experiences a rebirth as it is redeveloped into a busy industrial quarter, housing a wide range of craft activities. Beside the villa, a possible warehouse appears to have been prospered, with new rooms and a walled yard being added. Numerous late 4th century coins discovered at the site also suggest that the building was in use towards the end of, and possibly after, the official end of the Roman period in 410 AD. But even with the withdrawal of troops from the province, Ratai wasn't completely abandoned by the Romans. At least one former soldier and or public official remained, staunchly at his post. After an army career where he had received damage to his right upper arm and shoulder, and injuries to his left forearm and wrist, leaving them weakened, our soldier retired to Ratai, becoming a high-ranking civil servant, with all the badges of office and privileges due to him. This included the right to wear an elaborately decorated belt called a Singulum Militaire, complete with bronze plate and buckle featuring an interlocking spiral pattern and strap end in decorated with a pair of ornate crouching dogs. After his death in middle age, probably from an infection caused by an abscess in his jaw, our soldier was one of the last people to be interred in the Western Road Cemetery, buried in all the military and civic finery that was synonymous with the once proud Roman Empire he'd served until the end. After 300 years of Roman rule, the people of Ratai didn't stop being Roman just because Britain was no longer part of the empire. What we see from the archaeological evidence in the town is not a sudden decline in lifestyles after 410 AD, but rather a gradual change to a more agricultural way of life which didn't have a need for grand buildings, public baths or complex administration. By the early 5th century, heavy Germanic influences were already visible across the whole of the empire, mostly due to the influx of German mercenaries into the Roman army. These influences in style, art and language would only be enhanced and enriched as more and more Angles, Saxons and Jutes settled in Britain in the following decades and centuries. It is this merging and shifting of cultures in Britain that would lead to the emergence of the Anglo-Saxon era. It is so easy for us to imagine Roman Leicester at its glorious best, with huge civic buildings, temples, leisure facilities and elaborately decorated villas. But that version of Ratai only existed for a fraction of the time that the town was under Roman rule. So to focus on that version only would be like somebody from the future seeing Leicester today and thinking that this is how the city has looked for the past 300 years. Like Rome, Ratai wasn't built in a day. No, it evolved over hundreds of years, with each generation enriching the cultural mix of the town and adding their own stamp to the cityscape. We still live with the legacy of Roman Leicester today. Some of our main roads across the city follow those laid down by the Romans almost 2,000 years ago, whilst others echo the shortcuts through the ruins of massive civic buildings and private villas used by later generations. Either way, the city we know and love today would not be what it is had it not been for the Roman invasion and its subsequent effects on the town over the next 300 years. But it's the citizens of Roman Leicester that really give us an insight into life here two millennia ago. When we look closely at the people that lived in Ratai, we discover a fascinating socially and ethnically diverse mix of people going about their everyday lives, working, socialising, loving and dying, just as their forefathers had done in the Iron Age and their descendants would do in the Saxon era, just as we continue to do today. I hope that you've enjoyed this tour of Roman Leicester and, as a result, have a better idea of what the Romans did for us. Thanks for watching.